uh, who was a supervisor resigns or the position just comes up. And so what we want to talk about today is uh, how to prepare yourself for that supervisory role uh, prior to it happening, because that's very important to, to put the things in place that need to happen uh, so that if and when that opportunity comes, that you are prepared uh, mentally and through your abilities. So uh, we're going to talk about that today. And as you see, the slide that I have was someone stepping out uh, into the street, getting ready to cross the street. Uh, and so that you have to look at this like that because many people have desires or ideas about being a supervisor and so forth. It takes a lot, you know, to uh, to make that step because it's easy to sit back and have an opinion about the way things should be run. But it takes a lot for someone to take that leap of faith and to go out and say, well, I, I, I believe that I can make a difference. I think that I have some ideas. And, you know, if you have a good motive and good heart, then to, to take that first step. So what we want to talk about is how do you prepare yourself before you take that step? Now, the next slide that I'm going to transition to through the animation is this slide where you see a hiker going up a mountain. And I like to use that analogy because um, being a good supervisor is more than just uh, who's in charge. It's more than just uh, the mechanics of getting the work done. Uh, it's more than just being the boss. Uh, being a good supervisor requires some other things. So I like to use this image where we see this hiker going up this mountain. Uh, of course, you see him looking ahead. So he has a vision of the mountain and how it's going to make it. And, and certainly someone doing this would have a certain amount of security and belief that they can make it up that mountain. But also you see the things that this hiker has. You see certain tools that he's equipped, he or she has equipped themselves with, the poles, the backpacks. These are things that you are going to need on the journey. And if you're not prepared and equipped, then you may get halfway up that mountain and run out of resources, or it's a better chance that you fail. So one of the main things that we're going to talk about today is being equipped to do this and starting this process early. So especially for those who are in the listening audience that are new to the field or you've been in the field for five or 10 years and you're thinking about going into supervision, start the process now. Start making sure that you're prepared, that you've uh, made yourself knowledgeable in certain areas. And it's just a process that has to, to go on not and, and, and has to start before you actually get appointed into that position. So what we're going to be talking about today, uh, the objectives is to understand the critical factors involved in transitioning from bench to supervisor. Understand this is a development process that should begin before your elevation from the bench. Discuss, we're going to discuss four basic imperatives within this development process. Learn effective and non-effective leadership styles because being a good supervisor, as I said, is more than just focusing on getting the work done. It's how you get that work done. It's the resources that you have and how efficiently they are working towards you to get that work done. So that leads into the next bullet. Understand how employees respond to each, the effective and non-effective listening, and respond to the behavior styles that you have as a supervisor. There are some supervisors that, I mean, they even just think of an idea and people want to get right on board. And there are some that can you know, pull teeth, but no one will want to respond to an idea that you have or something like that. So what are the behaviors that a supervisor has or that they can exhibit that will make people uh, positive about following that leadership? Uh, develop an interesting, an understanding of how to effectively motivate and inspire people, which is what I was kind of talking about, and then obtaining vision for the laboratory and the employees. We're going to talk about in, that in a few minutes about you have to have a vision for what this lab can be because many people will come to work just to come to work. But how can you inspire them to do more or to be better than, than just coming to work every day? And that takes a vision because you have to believe in yourself that you can make a difference to take this lab to the next level. So we're going to talk about that today. And what I want to start off with today is a concept because if I were just to give this presentation and talk about the mechanics or the bullet points of supervision uh, that wouldn't that would leave out a lot about what is going to make you successful as being a supervisor. It, it, it doesn't take much to be a boss, but what makes a supervisor very successful and have an efficient team working behind them? So there's a thing that I heard from a motivational speaker early in my career called uh, the, the conditioning process. The speaker was Les Brown. And the conditioning process says that we are born 
uh, into this world, or even when you first get into histology, you have all these ideas and everything is green, green pastures and new. But sometime, uh, somewhere in that process, uh, say if you're a child or something, you get conditioned by life. You get conditioned by uh, the ethnic group that you're born into, the economic class that you're born into, whether you're born in the inner city or the suburbs or education. A lot of those things in the conditioning process start to uh, influence those things that you dreamed about doing, that you really believed that you could do, that were possible to you. So that conditioning process all of a sudden becomes stronger and stronger, and you see that red line, it becomes thicker and thicker. That's a, a boundary or a barrier to keep you from seeing those green pastures that you used to have or believing that you can go further or even, even go into supervision. Uh, some people say, well, I'm, they're being conditioned. Well, it's not going to make any difference anyway. So that takes you into this thing called a common consciousness. It's a common way of thinking to say, well, it's not going to make any difference anyway. You know, even if I take these extra courses or I start preparing or take this training, it's not going to make any difference because nothing's going to change. That's a common way of thinking. But what happened to those dreams and ideas that you had that were unique to you? No one had those ideas or those dreams except you. And most times, those are the things that drive us and make us successful. So we can't get caught up in this common way of thinking to say that, well, uh, I, I won't be able to achieve this or obtain that, or you know, maybe it's not going to be at the work site that you have there. But if you're career minded, then being a supervisor somewhere is, is very possible in your career if you're really focused on that. So you get to this common consciousness and next thing you know, there are no more thoughts and dreams. So we want to avoid that. And sometimes you see that in technicians that have been in the field, and I'm not saying anything against uh, those technicians that have been in the field 20, 25, 30 years, but sometimes you run into some that have lost those ideas and those green pastures and those thoughts, and they've settled into, well, nothing's going to change anyway. And that's a, that's a challenge for a supervisor. So that's something that you want to know about yourself and something that you need to understand uh, if you become a supervisor, that this element of common consciousness thinking might be in your work work environment. So let's talk about the preparation. Well, we talk, here's a model that shows the readiness and maturity level because you need to not only be ready, but you need to be mature in your mindset before you take on the responsibility of a supervisor. So when we look at this, we look at ability and willingness. So under ability, uh, am I prepared? Do I understand this? Do I, uh, do I understand what histology is all about and uh, all the different things that go along with it? So my knowledge, my experience, my competence, and my leadership ability. You need to have some of all of these before you are ready to go into um, a supervisory role. Now, some people come out of uh, doing their training. Uh, they've been through a one-year program, and that's fine. And I'm not going to say that some people aren't prepared for that already. But experience is a big thing when you become a supervisor because it's more than just well, I did the training and I did very well and I passed my HT and, and I'm ready. You know, experience on the job, on the bench makes a lot of difference because a lot of histology is troubleshooting, um, uh, understanding the process, working with people. So it's more than just, you know, understanding what's on paper and, and all of that. So then we talk about the maturity level, uh, being able to take initiative, feeling uh, secure enough to take initiative, Motivation, what's my motivation? Uh, sometimes you need to be self-motivated. You need to have confidence that you in your ability and what you're able to do. Interactive skills, you're gonna be working with people. It's not like you, can, you get an assignment on the bench and you, you're the number one tech and you feel very gratified about the quality of work that you put up. Now you're going to be interacting with people and trying to build that best, uh, pull that best out of them. And of course, self-regulation. Uh, this is the really the height of the maturity level. You are going to have to learn how to regulate yourself in times of crisis and in times of trouble because being a supervisor, and I'm sure those that are in the audience that uh, that are supervisors, you you know you understand you will get challenged. I mean, sometimes supervisors, sometimes employees will just they will not want to follow certain leads or certain authority in the laboratory. That may happen. Um, or you may have an issue with the laboratory. They're not giving you the resources that you want, but you're gonna to have to self-regulate. You're gonna to have to be able to um, control yourself or have discipline over yourself. So that's the willingness part. When you put these two together, when you've worked on these to a certain point, 
then you become uh, in a readiness standpoint. So readiness is a, a state of not only just understanding the job and the knowledge and ability, but it's actually a maturity level, a, a focus. Am I mature enough that I can do this job? And even when I get challenged, I'm still secure enough to stay focused on the goal that I have. I can still believe that we can take this lab to the next level. So the next slide, I'll give you five different supervisory foundations, five supervisory development and readiness readiness and maturity levels. Uh oh, so I just, I just messed up there. Um, so first, uh, technical knowledge, understanding the field, where primarily there are histologists in the field and in this audience now, but whether it's the clinical lab or whatever, but understanding the science, problem solving skills, and being secure in your position. And as I said before, this is more than just passing your HT exam and you, you graduate from the school. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's an intangible thing when you talk about experience and you don't have to have years and tons of experience, but you have to understand histo, histo technology to supervise time management. This is one of the biggest challenges that you're going to have, especially in this day and age. And I'd say probably the majority of people in the audience now, especially supervisors know, that um, you're very seldom given all the resources that you need. Manpower, you're usually short on that, uh, but you're going to learn how to prioritize your time. So how do we set timelines? How do we learn to multitask? Even when there's not enough time or people to do the work, you still have to be successful in accomplishing a certain job. You still have to get the slides out every day at a certain time. You have to meet the deadlines, the schedules. So we want to offer some, some ideas on how to prepare yourself for time management. Then oversight, a good supervisor has to have vision to be able to look at things the way they are and to see beyond that. Before you implement anything, there has to be planning. You have to sit down and think this out and what's gonna work and what's gonna hit a snag and what do you do once something uh, hits a snag and doesn't work. You, look, you have to have a non-biased assessment now. You know, sometimes we have our own ideas of what people should be and what people should do in their performance, but you have to take divorce yourself from that. And you have to really look at the environment and the people that you have and not hold them to your standards, but basically hold them to the, the basic standards of the laboratory. And then analytical thinking. How many people do I have? Who are the best that I have in these areas? Uh, what's it gonna take to get this, to take this lab to the next level? Uh, what's it going to take for us to maintain getting our slides out every day and meeting our couriers? You have to think about this. You can't just come into the lab every day and expect, okay, they're hit the couriers and so forth. Think about the fact that, okay, what if a machine goes down and we have to make some other kinds of arrangements? Analytical thinking ahead of time is very valuable. And then conflict management, very important uh, because you will have conflict, not just with employees, but sometimes with upper management. So self-regulation, how do I keep myself calm and maintained in the midst of this? Even when I'm right, uh, some of you all have worked with managers or directors who know nothing about histology, and that's, that's a real challenge. I've been in that situation too. But how do you continue to stay focused towards the goal so that you can interact with them and try to give them the understanding that you need them to have so that you can accomplish your job? Attitude, and what is the goal of, of the conflict management? Is your goal to, to conquer this person or to win this person over? Because conflict management isn't just isn't really about winning, it's about resolution. How do we resolve this and move on and get the job done? And the last is communication. And this is one of the most important things for a good supervisor to learn. One-on-one uh, -on -one and group communications, up and down management, uh, communicating with those that are uh, subordinate to you, that are under you, and also, being able to com communicate with your director or your supervisor or your manager. Uh, you, that requires tact and diplomacy oftentimes, especially if you're working with someone above you who does not understand. Many times the lab director, they say, well, the clinical lab supervisors, they can do this and at uh, the same time. Uh, they don't understand that clinical laboratory and the anatomic pathology laboratory, these are two different animals. When you talk about a clinical lab supervisor working the bench, that's totally different from someone working in histology, working the bench. For example, if we are called to sit down and cut biopsies because we're going to miss a courier or, or just because you need someone helping cut uh, in, in histology, 
it's different from uh, in the clinical lab because every five minutes the phone is ringing or with the doctor or some doctor calling or you have to get up and stop and do that. Uh, when you work in, on the bench, you have to dedicate that time to the bench or else you're going to back up the process. You stop and answer the phone for a doctor, you have blocks still sitting on your ice waiting to be cut, and those are slowing down the process, especially if it's biased. So it's very difficult sometimes to, um, to make, the, make someone above you understand that if they don't understand the difference between the clinical lab and anatomic pathology lab. So that's where it takes tact and diplomacy. And then also meeting management. In your communications, you have to meet with your staff. You have to do it some kind of way, either at weekly staff meetings, monthly staff meetings, or even just uh, morning huddles for like 20, 30 minutes. But you have to control that meeting. You can't have some people speaking out of turn or dominating the meeting. So you have to use meeting management in your communications. Even if you're just meeting with one person, you have to manage that meeting. So the next slide, we're going to talk about one of the first foundations, technical knowledge. Knowledge and understanding of the science and the field, uh, credentialing, board of re registry certification. I, I strongly recommend this. If you're not board certified at this point and you have an idea or you want to aspire to go into supervise, supervision or management, you need this, these credentials because it gives you what's called expert power, saying that you know the bare minimum to, to be competent in this field. So you need that credentialing uh, if you want to go into, so you need to start preparing for that now if you don't have that already. Experience with the applied science. Um, and as I said before, you can come out of a one-year program, but you've never really worked the bench like on a day-to-day -day basis, cranking out blocks. You need that experience. You need that experience working with the h &E so you know what happens and how to troubleshoot when one of the dyes starts to break down. Or you, Experience is very important. Um, can you get by without it? Yes. But it's much more difficult because you just don't have that knowledge base that experience will give you. Uh, so you start preparing for that now. Problem solving and troubleshooting skills, you will gain that on the job and you just get more involved when there's an issue in the laboratory, just as, as opposed to sitting back and waiting someone to fix it. Get involved and in express your ideas about what you think it might be or investigate that. Security and confidence in basic core function and abilities. You know, you have to be secure in what you know and what you've learned and your in basic core functions, uh, doing the job and your ability to do those jobs. Some people will challenge you, but you have to be secure and confident in that, that you can't be shaken with that. Next slide is the four imperatives of development. So motive, self-reflection, this is very important. Why do you wanna be a supervisor? Is it just because you wanna be in charge, just wanna be in control? And that's something you have to reflect on and ask yourself, because if it's just that you want to be the boss, then there's going to be difficulty with getting people to follow you. Um, if you want to be a supervisor, when I first became a supervisor, I really felt like I could make a difference, not because I was so arrogant and I think that my way is the best way and so forth. But I looked at things and I saw, you know, how some supervisors interacted with the staff and how negative that was on the staff getting in there and really producing quality work. I looked at some other things that could be done. Uh, I really felt that I could like address some of those things and make a difference. Did it always work? No, but I really believed that I could do that. And my motive was that I thought I could make a difference and make a better environment. So you have to check yourself for that. Second is vision. The ability to think about or plan the future uh, with imagination or wisdom. You see here the ability to see that which is beyond the common consciousness. Yes, the lab has always been this way, but does it have to stay that way? You have ideas that you can actually introduce into that. Vision is the revelation of things not yet. Faith and belief are the evidence of things not seen. It is the reality of the not yet. You know, you become a supervisor and you have ideas that have never been tried before. Never, no one's ever done this before. No one's ever continued to get all the work out for a full week without any delays or anything like that. We've never done that before. Well, why can't we do that? So I want to leave you with this quote from Robert F. Kennedy. Some men, some men see, and women, see things as they are and ask, why not? I see things that never were and ask, why not? And so you as a supervisor or an aspiring to be a supervisor, you have to challenge the process and just ask yourself, why not? Why can't we do this? What would it take for us to do this? Because I can't believe that, I mean, I don't believe that things are totally impossible. 
We just haven't figured out a way to do that yet. And then we also have to think about what's the cost to the changes that I have to make to make that goal that I think is, 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 a, is available. Next slide, vision. And I like to put up this slide. I used this slide once in a, in a, a supervision, a supervisory class that I taught. And vision is basically, I show this picture of this mountain and you look at the first mountain that's closest to you on the left and you say, oh, it's impossible. But if you have a vision that we can get up that mountain and you believe in that and you're a part of that vision and you work with the staff and you continue to reinforce that vision in your staff meetings, people will start to believe in your vision. Well, why can't we have like a 0% error ratio for the full month? We've never had that before, but why can't we? You know, maybe we might not get to zero, but here we're at 10 errors every month. Why can't we get down to five or less? So as you continue to see a vision of what's possible, people will start to buy into that vision. And as you can see, the vision just continues on. Uh, so you have to be able to see this, and you even before your staff. So four imperatives. The next one is planning. Very important for a supervisor. Um, how are we going to maintain this work every day? Uh, analytical thinking. What happens if one of the processes goes down? What am I going to do? Uh, what happens if three or four people call in sick? What am I going to do? It's analytical thinking of, uh, or, you know, that's if a problem comes up. But if you want to take the lab to another level, you have to think analytically. What is, what is it going to take? How much training am I, am I going to have to give to the staff to do this? You can't just have an idea and run out there and throw this idea out there. And many supervisors make that dreaded mistake. And you have chaos in the laboratory, confusion, and nobody buys in. But analytical thinking is very important. Courage to create, modify, or implement new strategy. Consider road, when you're thinking about these things, you have to consider the roadblocks and setbacks and strategic alternatives. Think about the problem and what you're going to do if a problem comes up before it hits you. Consider your role as the leader. Um, yes, you're the supervisor, but you're leading them through this process. You have to plan that out. Gather your team thoughts. Remember communication. You have to stay on point with the goal when you have a meeting because sometimes you'll have a meeting with the staff and people will be all over the place. Well, you know that we can't do this and we can't do that. So you have to stay on point with the goal. Our goal is to achieve getting these biopsies out every day at, before the 530 or 30 carrier car comes. So we give all kinds of thoughts and ideas on that. So the, uh, that is still part of that planning, the analytical thinking. I want to spend more time on that. So as part of analytical thinking, you have to make the observation. You have to look at the environment that you have, what's it going to take for you to, to make a change or, or, do, or do anything. You have to look at the personnel that you have. This is all analytical thinking. You know, uh, Am I going to have to change some things in the environment? And am I going to have to provide any extra training for my staff? Uh, data collection and, and, and sort. Mind mapping. You have to write this out. You can't just sit back in your thoughts when you're having coffee because these thoughts will run in and out. You need to put this down on paper to consider the things that might happen. Consider the things that were positive or negative for whatever you're trying to do as a supervisor. If we're going to bring in new biopsies or something like that, another client, you have to think about this and write this out. Well, what happens if the courier doesn't come on time? I mean, what are we going to do? Uh, the next understanding of the process, cause and effect on the staff. If we do some kind of change or we implement something, uh, what's the, how are we going to do it? What's the process? What's the cause of us having to do that? And how is it going to affect the staff? Now, the staff can say, well, why do we have to get these out at 5.30 uh, now? We, we, we were, we're, we're having trouble already making the couriers, and now you want to add this work on it. So how are you going to deal with that, the effect that it's going to have on the staff? You have to take a step back as a supervisor and make an assessment. And this is something, sometimes you just go out and you look over, and people see you just staring, out or staring, staring off over the lab. This, this is how you make an assessment. You look at what's going on in your lab, you look at how it's functioning each and every day, and then you go back and you do a self-assessment you know, on your own. Because that will give you information as to what's going to work, what might work, what will not work. Strategically consider alternatives or options. Don't get stuck on one idea because things, things will go wrong. So you have to have alternative options. All thoughts and ideas must remain goal-centered. Whatever we do, the goal is we need to get these biopsies by 5.30. We can try all these different ideas and so forth, but 5.30 is the goal. So that's what we have to be centered on. 
The next is I, I'm not I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is just a way of analyzing your staff. It's a six cell analysis that's used um, <clears throat> and staff assessment. And the one side on the left talks about individual motivation, and the, on the right it talks about uh, individual ability. So how ready are my staff on the left is or the workplace on the left uh, eager to do this? How much do they enjoy doing this job? Uh, and how do you deal with that if they don't? How much does the group, uh, and, and below that, how much do, does the group enjoy doing this job? Below that, does the organization support this? Like say continuing education. We used to have a monthly continuing education day. Well, how much did the staff enjoy that? Uh, well, some went kicking and screaming, and, but they didn't have a choice. Um, how much uh, do the colleagues, the, the, the entire staff, um, enjoy that? Third, does the company uh, support that? Do they give us that hour off? Do they help us by supporting the webinars? And then on the right, it's like, do they have the ability? Have they been trained to do everything that I want them to do in a laboratory? You know, everybody, most laboratories know that everybody's not competent enough to cut biopsies. But why can't they be? Do they need to be more uh, better trained? Um, th th it's not like they can't. I, th I think a lot of people haven't been developed that way. So you also take that down to the social ability and then the organization. So this is just very quick. I'm going to go past this. But you can use this six cell analysis to look at assessing your staff. Next part of uh, the development uh, for imperatives, implementation. When you start to implement a new plan or a plan, whatever. It has to be strategic. You have to show leadership, which means you have to be there because people are going to say, this is crazy and why are we doing this and so forth. The leader has to be there to help see this through each and every day or some kind of way they have to be accessible. Uh, there has to be clarity in what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, there has to be oversight. You have to stay on top of this because things will start to spin out of control sometimes and you have to be there to monitor that and to reassess if possible. Then mentoring and support. You know, your confidence in the staff being able to achieve something goes a long way. You have to mentor them. Yeah, that's okay that, that this happened. We, we were doing fine, guys, and uh, we'll be able to get past this. You give them support. And then leadership accessibility. Uh, when you implement something, you always have to be accessible because people will be nervous about change at first. So as a supervisor, you have to be able to do these uh, seven different uh, bullets. Uh, as part of your impl implementation process. Now, the next thing that is very important is time management. Supervisors rarely ever have time to take care of all the responsibilities that their jobs or their um, advisors or their directors expect them to do. Many times because those directors and supervisors above them or managers don't understand everything that it takes. So what you have to do is set up a project list, daily, daily task list, based on and prioritize um, the things that are most important. So I've given you two different, um, some models here just to look at. And what we've looked at here is this is just a task project list. And this is just something that you can actually put into a Word document that you see here. Uh, it's basically the items, item one, two, three, four, five, whatever, of the priority status, you see that, priority, medium, low, uh, projected date of completion. Uh, and this is very generic. And then below that, you have pending things that haven't been done yet. This is something that might work for you. And I'm only showing this as an example that you have to set up some kind of list. You can't just go into the lab every day and with all the things that we have to do as a supervisor, try to remember all of these things that you're supposed to accomplish. Something's going to fall through the cracks. And Dr. So-and-so will call and say, well, where's my so-and-so? You know, uh, you said you would get that to me yesterday. Uh, oh, well, it wasn't as big of a priority as something else but you didn't follow through with it. You didn't make, make some kind of a way to still get that done. So this is just an example. And then you can put that into a Word document, which is what I've done here. Same thing, but I just put that into a Word document. The next is uh, there's a, a online company called skillsyouneed.com. And they have this thing called a priority matrix that they uh, offer and they recommend. And this is just something that you can use as a model. You can modify this, but they have a priority matrix list where it says action, the, the do list, um, do first, do later, do next, don't do, it's not that really urgent. But how important is the task? So this is a way of organizing those things that are high priority and low priority. The next is another project to-do list. Same thing as I did before, 
uh, high priority, medium priority, low priority. This is actually segmented out. This might be something that, well, I don't like this. This is too cumbersome and it's fine. I'm not saying that you should do this, but you need something. So this is just an idea and I'm, you can put that into a Word document like this too. Simple Word document with three tables and I did this. Whatever works for you is fine. And that's important uh, because to be honest with you, I used to just take a, a piece of paper and I would write down all the things that I had to get done. And as, uh, as I got those completed, I would cross them out. And the more I looked at that list, I would look at the things that weren't crossed out. And, and those things would remind me that I need to get those things done. So it doesn't have to be something this formal of what I'm showing you here, but it does have to be done. The next slide I'm gonna show you is a detailed self-monitoring report. Now there may be a situation where your manager, your director, your lab director, they don't understand why you're not able to accomplish all of these different initiatives that they've given you. They don't understand how much time it takes if they expect you to work the bench, uh, that you still haven't done all these other things, the office paperwork. They don't understand because they don't really understand the histology process. So this might be something that you want to use that you can take and verify what you've done. You should the action initiated, the time that you spent on that, or it got interrupted because some doctor called and had me go look up a block and it took like 20 minutes. So, and then the reason that you had to interrupt that action, and then it was resumed and it was completed. Now I did this uh, for one job because once again, um, I was hit with, well, the clinical lab managers, they're all uh, supervisors, they're all able to do this, this and this. Well, like I said before, sitting down and cutting blocks takes a lot of time for a supervisor, but oftentimes, when we work the bench, that's what we're doing. Or we have to work in stains or something like that. It's more consuming than in the clinical lab because in the clinical lab, most of those things are automated. So it's a lot, It's like a night and day difference. But to get my director to understand that, I had to just start doing something like this. So this is just another example of what you could do. So now, conflict management and resolution. This is something that you're gonna be faced with and you're gonna to have to learn how to deal with this. So. You're going to have conflict as a supervisor. Everybody's not gonna like the ideas that you have or the fact that maybe it's not your idea, but you're enforcing that idea as a supervisor. They might not like the idea that you have to come to them about the quality of a slide that they produced, um, whatever. So we wanna talk about conflict management and conflict management begins with self-management. You have to stay controlled in this because you will get challenged and you will get tested. And the last thing that you want is a manager super arguing back and forth with a subordinate on the same level in the laboratory. Uh, you've already kind of lost that battle because you're you're down engaged on the same level. So you you remember your job is not to win this this, this argument. Your job is to resolve this conflict. So I remember a good great manager that I had once. Uh, his name was Jay Shokin. He used to tell me respond, never react. So you respond to someone saying something to you or their thoughts or their ideas, even if they're attacking you, but you never react to it. Just so that's something to keep in thought. Resolve the inner conflict first. You know, some supervisors, let's be honest. I mean, you may have a problem with one, one or two of your employees. Let's, I mean, let's be honest. You need to resolve that first because that will interfere with you doing your job as a supervisor. And it probably will affect how you interact with that person or don't interact with that person. When we have conflict, one of the main things that we want to do a lot of times is avoid that conflict. So we set up this barrier where we really don't communicate with whatever employee. That, that's not gonna resolve the conflict. That conflict is gonna stay there. So what is the goal? To resolve the issue or to conquer? Do you just want to conquer this person or, or do you wanna resolve the issue? Conflict resolution is a negotiation. Now there's some things that you can't negotiate. If it's an issue of quality or safety in the laboratory and the employee is saying, well, you don't understand, Skip, you know, this, this is, well, this is a safety issue. And I'm sorry, but we can't compromise on that. So let's talk about how we're going to get to this point where this safety issue is resolved because I can't compromise on that. That's a safety issue. It's a policy issue. You know, you need to come to work every day on time. That, I mean, yes, I understand this, this, and this, but this is a policy issue. This is not me. So we need to find a way to resolve that. And this is a negotiation. What is gained and what is lost? Okay, is winning, if that's the main thing to you, what are you losing in that? 
of you lo probably losing a relationship with an employee or who will now only do the bare minimum of what, what's expected because you've just conquered them and you've just subdued them because you're the supervisor and you have the power. But what have you gained? You won that, that uh, little battle, but you haven't really won them over to, to make them uh, more efficient in the laboratory to help you with your, your job as a supervisor. Utilizing good communication and, and negotiation skills is very important in conflict management. So I'm gonna run through this really quickly. This is just a model to show um, conflict resolution. And so in, in, in this model, you see when stress or conflict comes, most, most times we, we avoid that. We go to our separate grounds and then there's no resolution. Uh, one side, usually the side with power is domination. The other side is submission. But we need to learn to, uh, the bottom lines is integrate and compromise. There has to be some kind of way to come together where it's a resolution and not, not necessarily uh, someone winning like that. So next, let's look at types of conflict. So here I'm listing three different major, major types of conflict in the laboratory relationship. Uh, my emotions, well, I thought you were my friend, but you wrote me up and uh, here you're talking to me about slides that I didn't cut correctly. And sometimes there's conflict over that, misunderstandings. Um, some supervisors used control and power too much to, to try to resolve a situation. Data, we don't have enough information or there's a disagreement over the relevance. Well, why do we have to do it this way? I just don't really understand. There's a, there's a conflict right there. Uh, what's the meaning of doing all this? The interest. Some people have differing interests, uh, positions uh, taken earlier that people have had, and now things have changed. Uh, the parent needs uh, conflict. My needs and your needs conflict. I have a need as a supervisor to make sure that this work goes out every day. You have a need as, as an employee to have good, fair working conditions and so forth, and are those both those needs being met. So conflict continued, sometimes structural. Sometimes we don't have the resources that we need. This is a challenge for supervisors. You, most supervisors do not have enough personnel to get this work out every day, on time every day, but you're expected to. Uh, physical or geographic separations. Maybe you're not in the same building or location as your director or as the other technicians. Um, the lab is separated. Values, opposing beliefs. Uh, well, I'm the director and I believe that the supervisor should be able to conquer any situation. Well, you try to talk to your director and they say, well, just get it done. Well, their belief is that I should be able to just get it done. But as a supervisor, I need help. Uh, opposing lifestyles, ideology, a different criterion for evaluation. These are all types of conflict. So some strategies for dealing with different types of conflict. Uh, structural, uh, acknowledge the differences, understand the impact of the conflict, explore BATNA, which is best alternative, to negotiated agreement. Now, what, what's the best alternative we can have that will help ne negotiate an agreement? Except that there may not be anything that I can do about this. Well, Skip, you know, this lab wasn't designed to do this. And many of us are in labs that weren't designed to be histology laboratories. But they put us in there, they put some microtomes in there, and we have to work with it. And you, know, you have to be honest, I can't change the surroundings. Uh, I can try to get us new equipment, but I don't have control of that. Um, there's some things that I can do and some things that I can be honest. So then the values, identify, uh, dealing with these values, identify, acknowledge the differences that we have together, myself and the employees, the supervisor and the employees. Find solutions to validate both. And then results. This is the results of successful and unsuccessful conflict resolution. Successful, uh, stronger working relationships. Once you start to negotiate and you start stop trying to dominate, people will actually have a different relationship with you. Encouragement of creative solutions, they will come back to you with more ideas, they will open up. Unsuccessful, uh, damaged relationships, inhibits expression of valuable opinions, people will shut down and they'll just think, well, you're not gonna listen anyway, so I'll do whatever you say. Well, that hasn't really resolved the conflict. You have an employee now, who is probably not as efficient as they could be because they're only gonna do just barely what needs to be done. Next slide, some common barriers to conflict resolution. Poor listening, wanting to be right at all costs, 
believing there is only one way, blaming and focusing on others, uh, on solving the problem, attacking people and not the problem, and stereotyping people. These are things that you need to resolve within yourself if you're a supervisor to really uh, help resolve this conflict with the person. Presuming, presuming I'm going to put these up real quick. We already know other things, not being open, letting a few people dominate the meeting. You know, you can't have a meeting because there are some strong personalities and they'll always want to have an opinion. They'll always uh, want to say something in the meeting, but you have to solicit the ideas of everyone to resolve the conflict. You want to get everyone's ideas and thoughts, not sharing the same information with everyone, letting the ego, power, status, and so forth get in the way, talking with peers or other people. Now, communication, one-on-one -on -one as well as group, very, very important for a supervisor to be able to not only establish but to maintain. Up and down management. As I said before, one of the biggest challenges that you will have as a supervisor will be being able to communicate and interact with your superior not necessarily um, the, uh, the those that are working under you. Because sometimes our superiors don't really understand what we do. So you need to meet with them regularly. Uh, you need to use tact and diplomacy when you're talking to them. And I'm saying all these ideal things. Sometimes these things work, frequently they do not. And the thing is, you're, if you're in a situation like that, that's something that you're going to have to try to resolve. Um, because they, whoever's over you, they have their opinion, they have their ideas. Hopefully, they will listen to what you're saying, um, but maybe not. So you have to work within that. Meeting management. In your meetings, you need to be a good communicator, give, give good information. You have to use effective listening skills uh, when you're talking to an employee because whatever they're talking about or however they feel, this is the reality to them. So you have to at least listen and understand uh, why they feel that way. Organization, clarity, and honesty when you're having a meeting. Now. Uh, Friedman, Edwin Friedman gives these three different uh, links to, um, to communication. And here you see a linear causation that he lists where A would be the employee, B might be the supervisor, C might be the uh, manager, and D might be the director. Now, if A is only communicating with B and there's no interaction or communication between C and D, depending on B, the supervisor, and some bias that they may or may not have, that can affect what the manager and the director feel about employee A. So this is not a good system to have. You need to have general meetings. Uh, you need to meet with um, um, more than just the one employee. So let's move on to the next model. Here's a multiple causation where E would be the supervisor and all of these different resources are meeting into them, but they're not together. They're not working together. So Friedman says that multiple systems working together, all of this, the team meetings and so forth, this is the best thing that you want to have in a situation because it gives everybody an opportunity for input and to, to collaborate on their ideas and so forth. So it takes time to do this, but you need to have staff meetings or morning huddles or some kind of way to achieve this. So effective listening, uh, I mentioned this before, why is this important? I'm see these different things that I bulleted under here. Uh, you need to try to understand. Well, you don't have to agree with it, but to understand why the employee feels this way or why a person feels this way. People will respect you because you listen. It promotes relaxation, opening up, uh, clarifies perceptions where they may feel this way and that may be totally different from what you intended them to understand. You cannot influence what you do not understand. Understanding must precede influence. You cannot change a person's ideas if you don't understand why they feel that way. So here's a, a, a model of effective listening skills, demonstrating concern and demonstrating lack of concerns. And so it can be uh, nonverbal or verbal. And so you walk into an office and you, someone demonstrates concerns, they're looking right at you, they're making eye contact, they're listening, they're speaking back to you, they're summarizing what you're saying, as opposed to someone and I'm sure someone in the audience has had this kind of supervisor I have who wasn't listening. You're going to tell them about something. They're working on their computer, doing something. Um, they're just not paying attention. Their verbal responses are not, you can tell that they didn't really hear what you said, or they're not really, they don't really understand. It's like a deer in the headlights. They're not really speaking about anything. Uh, but so I want to move on to this macro versus micro supervisory skills. 
yes, you are going to be evaluated on your macro skills, but you have to have micro supervisory skills also. You can be overseer, employee monitor, or enforcer, or you can help being a facilitator, an organizer, or a coordinator. Now, the thing is, the one on top is, is the boss. Anybody can do this because you've been given the power and authority as a supervisor. This just doesn't take a lot of skill to be the boss, to be the, uh, the person that makes sure the work get out, gets out every day by force or whatever. But a supervisor below that does these things is a leader. You will lead people to, to understand patient care, patient uh, quality, uh, that the patient is in, involved in this and what's really important. So I leave, list this also to show that on the left, you see the corporate focus or supervisors come in and they they have to worry about budget, uh, super, uh, services, productivity, quality. This may be a management issue, but also supervisors are involved in this. But you have to understand that this engine, this train of the budget for services, productivity and quality, the fuel that drives that train are your resources, your employees. So how you deal with them gives the fuel to run that train efficiently. Yes, we're gonna get this stuff done every day, but we could get it done a lot better and more efficiently if, I de if I'm uh, aware of the morale and the attitude and the satisfaction of the employees. So as a supervisor, you don't just go out and say, well, we need to get this work done every day. You know, you need to interact with the employees. So how's it going today? Um, any issues, any problems? Uh, whatever, you need to actually be more than just a clinical supervisor. So this is leadership or this is good supervision. When you connect those two together and understand that it takes the one on the right to drive the one on the left. So I'm giving you a couple of things right now that I'm gonna run through these very quickly because we're kind of running out of time. But these are some things that are important to employees. Basic organizational leadership goals, uh, budget attitude services, Productivity and quality, this is just what we saw on the last slide. And these help with the key personal goals of employees, uh, belonging, survival, power, and freedom, and fun. These are the five things that are really important to the employee. You know, I need for security. I need to know that I have a job to come here every day and you're not gonna give me a pink slip. I need to have power, certainly over my ability to work and be a good technician. I need to have freedom, certain amount of freedom. I need to have a sense of belonging, team working together. And we need to make this some kind of way fun, not just work coming to every day. So as a supervisor, you consider all of these things that the employees want and needs. Employees have three basic needs. Um, somebody, one of these three needs are, are, are most important. Need for power, need for affiliation, need for achievement. Well, you assess your staff. Who are those that in the, in the group that they really need to dominate or to be in control or to be uh, in power. Uh, some of those may or may not be the ones that are ideal to run a project for you. But you have to watch that because sometimes their need for power can, can spin out of control. But they might be the perfect person that needs to be assigned to a special project. Need for affiliation. You have people that are in the laboratory that um, like the involvement, the social involvement of being involved. Um, you have need for achievement. Uh, you don't want to have one of your star uh, uh, performers or star technicians sitting down just grinding out blocks every day and nothing else. Um, get them involved in special stains. Get them involved in immunohistochemistry because you're feeding that need that they have and they're going to feel more positive about their jobs. So these slides I'm going to run through very quickly. These are seven basic power bases that we have. And so you decide which power base you want to operate out of. Coercive power is you have the power to make them do this or write someone up or discipline as opposed to like referent power, which is the fifth one down, that's relationship power. Power the reward, I may not be able to give you a raise, but I can give you acknowledgement. I can tell you how great a job that you did. Connection power, who am I connected with in the laboratory? Legitimate power, um, am I board certified? Um, I'm, I'm the supervisor, so I have a certain amount of legitimate power. Oops, information. They see, the employees see you has, as having information power because you bring them information about what's going on in, this, in the system and in the organization. Expert power. This is the power that you have because of your credentials, because of your board certification. Now this, a lot of this, is you may feel that you have reference power, 
but some of your employees that maybe had to have gone into corrective action for something may see you totally different. It's based on the perception of the employee and ability and willingness involved. So how they perceive you is a, is a, is a big thing. You can't say, well, that's on them and that's their problem. I'm not like that. This is the reality to them. So you have to, as a good supervisor, you have to be aware of that and you have to work on that because your job is to get them the most efficiency that you can out of the employees. So leverage servant leadership. I'm getting into something else now. Uh, be a good supervisor. You need to, you know, a good leader will serve their employees. Above all, leadership is a position of service by Max Dupree. Uh, Mar Laura Beth Jones says the principles of service is what separates true leaders from glory seekers. There are some people that just want to be the supervisor, just want to be the boss. But how many want to lead a group of people so that we can be the best laboratory ever? I used to tell my staff, this is the best histology lab in the, in the city of St. Louis. And they look at me like, yeah, right. And I, I really felt that. And if we weren't, I felt that we could be. And so I constantly said that. Let's look at this very quickly. All of you have had leaders that you really admired and so let's look at this. This is some of the things that came from employees, uh, their opinions. They, uh, they gravitate towards honest uh, leaders, competent leaders, fair-minded, communicates. So if you're not doing these things, or if you had someone who wasn't this way, think about how you interacted with that, with that supervisor. Think about your relationship with that supervisor. Did you really want to go to 110% for them when they, had, they didn't have any of these qualities? So this is as a supervisor, you want to try to Develop these skills or these traits and emulate them. Behavior, as a supervisor, sometimes you're going to have to be task-oriented, which means you're going to have to be directive. Uh, you come in one day at 3 o'clock in the morning and 2 or 3 of the processors went down and you're behind. And you have couriers coming by at 5.30. This is not time for a staff meeting. You have to be directive and say, okay, we're going to pull two people and work on this first uh, hospital so we can get that out. We're gonna have this person wait. You need to give instruction, what to do, when to do, where to do, how to do, and who to, who's gonna do it. You don't wanna stay in this. And some supervisors get stuck in this task behavior where they're just like micromanaging. You don't wanna get stuck there. The next is relationship behavior. This is the most powerful uh, tool that you will have. It's a two-way communication. You listen to the employees, it clarifies, explains why we're doing this, you recognize and praise, and that's very important. Histologists work very hard, oftentimes two, three, four in the morning. How many times does somebody come by and say, I really appreciate you getting to work on time every day and helping us get these biopsies out? Uh, some supervisors look at that, well, that's your job. But how much more does it, how much more valuable is it to an employee when someone says, you know, you, you, I saw those slides that you turned out today, those were, those were excellent. Believe it, it goes, it, goes, it goes 10 million miles. They're supportive. So I'm going to end the presentation now by just giving you a reflection on uh, things. As a supervisor, everything's not going to work. I remember someone helped me when I, I moved to California and uh, my career was kind of stalled. And this person told me about the concept of the seventh wave theory. And they said, you know, you look, and they took me out. We were at the beach. And they said, look at the seventh wave. It's always the biggest wave. You have all these small waves that come up but then there's that seventh wave that always goes up farthest. So as a supervisor, when you are trying to emulate things or trying to implement things or trying to just get things done every day, you have to understand it's not always going to be perfect. There's not a, it, you're not always going to get 100% buy-in, but stay focused on your goal. Stay focused on why you wanted to be a supervisor, not just to run the place, that you thought that you could make a difference. Uh, stay focused on the fact that you want to hear your employees' ideas. And that seventh wave, I guarantee you, I mean, I can say this because I've lived this. I've been in this field for 40 years and I've managed a couple of different places. And this, this really works. And when you start believing in this, you become encouraged and you start looking forward to going back in the next day. So our impact, oh, our impact on life, whatever you do as a supervisor, you are setting footprints in the, in the life of, of other people, especially if it's a young uh, technician impressionable. If you're the kind of supervisor that just uh, degrades them and uh, never praises them, never gives them any ideas or anything like that, I'm going to have to hurry up and finish. That will stay with them pretty much all of their career. But if you're an inspiring type of person, they will remember. I remember those supervisors that inspired me. 
to this day, I remember those that cared about, you know, what I was doing in the laboratory and offered me training. So the last is when you do this, your visions continue to go. They go higher and higher and higher. Your vision just doesn't stop at that one mountain. It just continues on and on and on. And your staff will continue to believe that we can get to this next mountain and this next mountain. They will continue to, they will start to follow you and embrace the things that you've said. So I wanna end up by showing that supervision is not a job. Supervision is a journey. So supervisory leadership is the key. We talk about being a supervisor, but you need to be a good leader to be a good supervisor. So I know I've kind of gone over my time almost, and I wish I could explain this one slide more, but um, I'm gonna give this uh, presentation back to Josh and just say to you all before I leave, thank you so much. I know I kind of ran through this. This was like a three hour presentation workshop crammed into one, but there was so much rich information for those of you who wanna be a supervisor that I didn't wanna take anything out. So please download this handout and go over some of the material. You have my email uh, on the front slide and feel free to email me directly if you have need more clarification or explanation about something. And remember, you can get up that mountain. You can be a good supervisor. You can provide something better for your staff. It doesn't have to be the way it's always been. You have great ideas and your staff needs that in the laboratory. So thank you very much for attending and Josh, I'm gonna turn it back over to you.